I want to preface this message just with a just with a, a quick kind of an overview of how the scripture views humanity, how the scripture views mankind. There's there's two states of man, human beings. There's two there's two states of human beings, and then there's two conditions of the believer. So the two states of human beings are are natural men and new men. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians 2. Verse 12. 1 Corinthians 2, 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Verse 13, these things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Verse 14, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Verse 15, but he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that we may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. So we see that, so we see that the natural man, verse 14, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So a natural man is someone who's unsaved, he's, un, he's not born again, this, a saved this, this natural man can either be God, God conscious or void of consciousness of God. Um, you know, being God conscious means you, you kind of know that there's gods out there. You know, God says that he, the eternity has been written in our hearts. Every human being on the planet is a three-part person. He's a spirit person. He or she is a spirit person. They are a, a physical person, and they have a soul, a spirit, a soul, and, our, and a body. And as a result of us having, being a spiritual being, there is a sense that every single person on the planet is aware that there's God. The scripture says that there is no excuse for not believing God. Uh, Romans 1.21 says the invisible things of God can clearly be seen and understood by those things which, even his eternal power and the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, by those things which are made. So the physical planet, the physical planet speaks very clearly. I love NOVA and nature programs, even though their narrative is whacked because they, they get into talking about a zillion years ago, this fish was something else before it was. It's all speculation and supposition. It's like, give it up. You know, this is not scientific. These are theories. What amazes me is that when they start unpacking the mysteries of nature, to me, it just says, go God. Man, it just, it just, it just speaks of that. A few years ago, we used to do a week-long thing in the summertime with, a, with our teens called... Um, uh, worldview, yeah. How many, of you, how many of you guys remember that? Some of you have been here, have done that. We would do a week of worldview, and then at the uh, one year, I think, I'm not even sure what year it was, we took the, uh, the whole group up, there was about 15 of us, went up to uh, Carnegie Science, uh, no, no, Carnegie Natural History Museum in Oakland, the Carnegie Museum. They have this beautiful display of dinosaurs, you know, the dinosaur bones are there, and they, they have the whole place decorated like it with big vines and big trees and little ponds and birds and all this other kind of stuff in there. And we're going through this, and of course, every placard talks about millions of years ago this and millions of years ago that. And, uh, you know, we'd read the, read the placard. And I, part of the whole thing was teaching them how to discern what truly is scientific and what is theory. You know, theory is, a, is an opinion. You know, science is fact. Science can be reproduced in the laboratory. Science, there is no one there to view the birds becoming, reptiles becoming birds or, or amphibians becoming reptiles and all that other kind of stuff. It's all supposition. So we did all that and we went, went through the museum and then the curator for that whole section of the museum saw this little group going around and this guy talking and all these different things. So he came over to see what was going on and I had some conversation with him and and I told him, you know, we're just, uh, I'm a pastor, and this is some, some of our youth from church, and we're, you know, we're up here, uh, you, know, uh, seeing the, you know, seeing the natural history and, and how it correlates with the scriptures and all those kinds of things. Well, immediately he became a little, like, ready for, you know, ready for some hostility, you know, thinking, you know, Christians and all that other kind of stuff. So 
we, we just chatted for a minute and then we, we separated. The last probably 20 minutes we were there, I gave the, I said, everybody, you guys, just go do whatever you want to do. Go see back to see what you want to see, whatever areas, you know, use the bathroom and such. We'll meet here in 20 minutes and we're going to leave. So I'm on the third floor standing on this platform on the third floor looking down, second story, two stories down, and there's the big, uh, you know, the Tronosaurus uh, Rex and the Triceratops and all the dinosaurs and all that kind of stuff is there. And the guy walks over and he goes, uh, he, he goes, you know, what did the kids think? I said, oh, they really, they really enjoyed it. I said, I haven't been here for years since, my, since I brought my kids up here. You guys really have some great improvement. I said, man, isn't this fantastic? I look at this, look at this marvelous display that you guys put together that demonstrates the, the unique creativity of God in the, in the, you know, the literal six-day creation. You know, and, 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 and he's, like, he's like, how so? Like he was perplexed that I would even think that their extraordinary display was, you know, spoke of the magnificence of God. And I said, every single creature, you know, one of the things that, that really speaks clearly to me and everything you have in here is there's no transitional fossils. A transitional fossil is fossils that would be part amphibian, part reptile, part bird, part, uh, part reptile, part bird, part reptile, part mammal or whatever. You know, there is no transitions in between these things. Everything is unique, you know. Uh, and I said, uh, you know, these, these massive creatures that were created, you know, perfectly came into existence by, you know, by, by God speaking, whoever I did it, you know, I just, you know, I just did that. And it really gave him, he was like perplexed initially, then he was looking at me in, intrigued by this idea that, you know, then I had quoted Romans, the invisible things are God, God can be clearly seen. I said, this, doesn't this just speak of a God? I says, you know, somebody designed this, this magnificent building here, this big old stone building here on Forbes Avenue. Somebody thought of what it would look like, created it, and made this beautiful space that you have all these artifacts in. I said, God thought in his mind how to make all these magnificent creatures on the earth. And it just speaks of the, of the divine, of the uh, intelligent design. That's a term that, that Indo uh, scientists are using now because they're recognizing the idea of, of just lots of time and lots of chance random things happening in the biological world does not recreate new beings. Everything, is, everything actually becomes, becomes worse than it was prior. So I said, you know, intelligent design is just all through this place. And then I, you know, and I, and I went on about with that with him. So that was uh, an interesting thing, exchange that occurred. But the point is, is that there are people on the planet that are aware that there's God, there's a God consciousness, but they're a natural man. They don't have any spiritual understanding. They don't have any spiritual connection with God. You can see that by all the vi different isms that are in the world, all the various religions that are out there in the world. Their attempt, you know, ancestral worship, worship of the stars, all these kinds of things. They're trying to attempt to, to connect with this spiritual component they have, knowing that there's a God that's out there. So we have natural men. They're not born again. Their name's not in the book of life. Uh, you know, the, they're devoid of, of biblical spiritual understanding. Then we have what's called the new man. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. So the, the, the two conditions, the two states of man is a natural man, and we see the second state here in Ephesians 4, multiple places, but I just picked a couple of verses. Ephesians 4.22 says that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and you be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So when you become a new creation, the Bible says when we, we become born again, when you come to know Jesus as your personal Savior, and you make the transition from being conscious that there's God out there, knowing about God, to actually knowing him personally through a personal relationship with Jesus, when you do that, the Bible says you become a new man. The King James says you become a new, uh, a new creature. There's a new, you become a new creation in Christ. The old way of life is past. Behold, there's a new way of life. How many of you have experienced a new and living way of knowing Jesus and walking with him? I mean, it's a whole new adventure. It's a whole new understanding. It's a whole new worldview. You begin to view your world. You begin to view yourself, others, in this world from a biblical context instead of from, a, from just a natural context. So we have this, this new man. Look at uh, Colossians 3. Colossians 3, verse 10. 
And that's not the right one. It's not the right verse. Okay, I'm not sure what that is. Let's try Galatians. I know, I know that one will work. Galatians 6.15. I think I got some dyslexia going on there when I type that up. Galatians 6.15 says this. For in Christ neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. So this is new creation. So we have the natural man and we have a new man or a new creation, a new creature. We have those two states of being. We see this in 1 John chapter 5 verse 10 says this. They that have the Son have life, but they who do not have the Son do not have life. So we have the haves and the have-nots. Those that have the Son, those that have, have the Son as their Savior, they have the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of adoption is within them, they have life. But those who do not have the Holy Spirit have not been adopted into the kingdom, have not received Christ as their Savior, they do not have life. So we have these two states. And then we have two conditions of the believer. There's two conditions of the believer. We see this in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3. Let's go back to that first course 3. Continue with where we started off in the passages there. 1 Cor 3 verses 1 through 4. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able. For you are still carnal, for where there are many envies, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and, uh, and behave like mere men? For one says, I am of Paul, another says, I am of Paulos, are you not carnal? So we see this term carnal here. This, he says, like, brethren, verse 3, 1, uh, chapter 1, 3, I says, I could not speak to you as if you were a spiritual person, but as if you were a carnal person. So a carnal person is basically an immature believer a carnal person is a person who knows Jesus as their Savior. Their name is written in the book of life. If they were to die today, they would be absent from their body and present with the Lord. They would be saved. But yet they're acting as if they were a mere man. They're acting as if they were carnal. I mean, they're, act, they're acting as if they were a natural man. So this is someone who's born again, but they're acting and behaving and governing their life as if they weren't born again. You know, and what's going to happen to that person if there isn't a transition and growth doesn't begin to happen and transformation doesn't going to be, begin to happen, what's going to happen is, in most cases, is they, their faith will slip through their fingers and they're, they're going to end up back being the way they were, being a natural man and forsaking the things of the Spirit. They'll allow that. They'll, they'll allow. You know, there's, there's a contention that's going on. In, in Galatians chapter 5, it tells us that the, that the spirit man and the carnal man are at enmity against each other. They're fighting against each other, the flesh and the spirit. There's a war that's going on for your, for, your, uh, for your devotion to something. Are you either going to be devoted to your old life or are you going to be devoted to your new life and devoted to Christ? And it, and it, and it's, uh, so we have this, this condition of the believer. This is the believer who is born again, but he's acting like he's not born again. He's still acting selfish, self-centered, still making all of his decisions from his, from his natural mind, not leaning on the things of the Spirit, not acknowledging the Lord in all of his ways so he can have his paths directed, not crucifying his flesh, not looking at, not assessing his life and realizing that my light, what, what I see in scripture and what I see in here is a great contrast and I got to do something about it in order to get my life lined up with the scriptures. So that's a carnal person. Then we have a spiritual person, a spiritual man. A spirit man is someone who, spirit man or woman, is someone who's come to the conclusion that they are desperately dependent upon the life of the Holy Spirit to make a transformation in their heart and in their lives. There is, a spiritual man is not a person who's reached perfection. No, you've, you've not reached sinless perfection. It's impossible. You've not, re, you've not attained you know, uh, a, a great grasp of the scriptures yet. That's a lifelong endeavor of coming to fully understand the character of God through the scriptures and understand the word, rightly dividing the word, all those kinds of things. But you're, but you're on the journey. You, your face is towards God. Your heart is towards God. And everything within you says, I want to live for God. I want to be pleasing to God. I want to be a transformed person. I want to bring glory and honor to Jesus in everything that I think, everything that I say, and everything that I do. When, you're in that, when your heart is in that, in that area, 
You're not a spiritual person. You're a spiritual person. Again, so you, you have to recognize, you know, think about where you're at in that. If your heart is in that direction, even though you still got issues, how many of you got issues? You know, how many of you got some things that still aren't, you know, you're still wanting, you're still contending within yourself to, to see victory, to see Jesus, you know, bring victory in your life. Yeah, it's okay. You're, that doesn't mean you're not spiritual. You know, it's it, the, the assessment for spirituality, again, is the heart that's completely devoted to God. That, that every fiber in your being says, I want to honor Jesus. I want to bring glory and honor to his name. I want to live for a greater purpose than for my own pleasure. I want to live for a greater purpose than for my own comfort. You know, I want to live, I want to, I want to do something that's going to have eternal significance in this world. You know, you, you begin to think less about yourself. Less, not, you don't think less of yourself, but you think less about yourself and you begin to think more about others. You know, the old acronym JOY, J-O-Y, J-O-Y, J, Jesus first, O, others second, and Y, yourself last. You know, the kingdom of God is what? Righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. You know, if we keep our minds stayed on him, we'll be kept in what? Perfect peace, right? We are made righteous because Why? Jesus has imparted his righteousness to us, not because, you, not because you don't do the don'ts and you do the do's, but you're righteous because you've received righteousness. The gift of righteousness has been deposited within you. you know, so that's what the, what the spirit man is. So I'd hope that all of you are, you know, you, wherever you see yourself, and I, and I said that not to bring any guilt or condemnation. I said all what I just said to bring clarity about where you're at in your spiritual journey. One of the things the scripture says, there, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who what? Who walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. So your heart is in that direction. You're that spirit man. There's no condemnation. So wherever you're at on, your, on the growth track or the, the arch of scale of reaching spiritual maturity, wherever you're at, as long as that thing is going up, guys, you're on the right track. When that thing plateaus, you need what? Revived. You need to rethink, you know, if you find yourself, you know, if you find yourself on, on this plateau of growing and maturing in Jesus, then you kind of, I'll tell you what will happen. You're either growing or you're dying as a Christian. That's what it is. There, there is no, there is no cruise control following Jesus. You know, last week I talked about all the buttons I discovered on my thing, on my, on my van. You know, there is no cruise control button where you just, well, my name's in the book of life. I'm sealed, signed, and delivered, ready to go to heaven, and I'm just going to kind of kick back in my easy chair and, and cruise, cruise through life here, waiting to exit planet Earth into the arms of Jesus. You know, that's a plateau. And what's going to happen is, you know, the, the laws of trajectory and the, and the laws of diminishing returns and the laws of thermodynamics come into play in the spiritual realm as well, and you begin to, you begin to go down. So you start off on fire for Jesus, you reach a place, you kind of plateau, you level off, you be kind of ho-hum, humdrum, come to church when it's convenient, read your Bible when it's convenient, or when there's a crisis. You know, you're just kind of coasting along here. You've neglected the duties of, of, of living for Jesus, of being a king and a priest, exercising your authority, exercising your dominion, making an impact in others, looking for opportunities to spread the gospel and all those kinds of things, just kind of, kind of coasting along. What's going to happen is you're going to continue to degrade, degrade, and at some point, some point. Anybody know anybody that was strong on fire for Jesus at one point in their life? And now they're like not even sure that there even there is God anymore. I mean, how many, anybody, raise your hand if you know some people like that. Yeah, look at that. Over half the congregation knows that. So you know what I'm talking about. That's how that happens, saints. That's why we got to stir the fire. That's why we got to, you know, we got to be, there has to be a, a sense of contentment with discontentment. Got to keep those two things in tension. You know, that you're, you're content to have your name in the book of life, but there's more. And I'm not content to just, just to be a Christian and follow Jesus and try to keep my nose clean and make it to heaven. There's more. Heaven is the furthest thing from my mind when it comes to living for Jesus. The Bible says that, you know, the kingdom of God is at hand. It's right here. You know, that we receive from the kingdom. We are members of the kingdom. We are joint heirs with Christ. We are citizens of heaven. We are ambassadors. We represent God. So every one of us needs to be about our master's business. So the difference that makes in this journey, saints, in this, in this graph of reaching spiritual maturity, whether our graph is going to kind of go like this, 
as we as you know these are the this is spiritual maturity over here on this side of the graph this is time on this bottom part of the graph you know how those graphs go so we start over here we get become born again and we start on our journey and whether we have a kind of a graph that's just barely barely makes any improvement year to year year to year or whether we have a graph that's like a pretty sharp angle and it's coming up depends upon a huge part of this depends upon our relationship with the Holy Spirit, whether we embrace the truth of the scriptures, whether we embrace the baptism of the Holy Spirit, or whether we shy away from the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Makes a huge difference. Makes a huge difference. The baptism is power. We're giving, you know, we sang about reviving in us. Well, what, do you, what, what does that mean? What does that mean to be revived? It means to, be, to receive power, to be able to receive dy dynamic supernatural ability to be on that on that sharp trajectory towards towards spiritual maturity and continue that you know continue in that course and not you know some of us have <laughs> some of us have this kind of a graph you know you, you know back and forth and back and forth how many uh, how many of you have worn out your rededicator because you're constantly rededicating your life to the lord you know uh so this baptism of the holy spirit is huge um Look at Matthew, look at Luke 24. Turn to Luke 24, 49. One verse there. This is in the this is the end of Jesus' conversation in, recorded in Luke. We have Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We have those three books, those three gospels all have uh, a rendition of Jesus' last few minutes or hours with his disciples before he ascended into heaven. Right after Jesus says this, he ascends into heaven uh, in Luke. Uh, 24, 49, Jesus says this, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. He told the disciples also in, in Mark and Matthew again to go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Spirit, wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit to come. It's interesting, you remember how John the Baptist introduced Jesus to the world? Jesus, right before he, right before he was water baptized, and received the Holy Spirit, and uh, you know, it came descended from heaven upon him for enablement for ministry. He, uh, John the Baptist, said, uh, "Behold!" And he, so you know, he, they said, "Are you the Messiah?" They asked John the Baptist, "Are you the Messiah?" And he goes, "No, I'm not even worthy to be the lowest servant and wash his feet and undo his sandals." But when he, I baptize you with water, John says. But when when the Messiah comes, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire, Holy Spirit and fire. We're going to unpack that here in a little bit. So, so that's the introduction, Holy Spirit and power. He didn't say when the Messiah comes, he's going to take away your sins so you can go to heaven, so you can die and be with him. He didn't say that. He said you're going to be back. When he comes, his purpose for coming, his purpose for coming is, is to save the world. He said, Jesus said, I came to seek and save the lost. But it's more than just seeking and saving the lost. It's more than just rescuing, us, rescuing sinners from, from the fires of hell and the grip of king, the kingdom of darkness. It is that you would receive fire and you would receive power to be able to live for him and to be able to continue his ministry. So this word tarry says here in Luke 24, send the promise of my father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem. The word tarry means to be seated, waiting and abiding until something arrives. So it's kind of like, it's almost like sitting at the airport. You know, you, they tell you you should show up two hours before the airport, so you show up three hours because you never know what's going to happen, how long the line's going to be and all that. And you just kind of, you're just sitting there waiting for them to say, you know, all of those in section number three for flight 168 to Chicago, you know, you can be boarded now. You're just kind of sitting there waiting, right? So this is what this is. It's just go sit and wait until what I've promised you arrives. Or some of you, how many of you sit at home waiting for Amazon truck to pull up the driveway, you know. You can't wait for that thing to be delivered to you that you've been waiting for, you know. They promised it. It was interesting when you first got Amazon Prime, it was like the next day. It's like, how do you do that, man? Like the next day, the thing is here. Now it's like, if you get it within a week, you're happy, you know. Like, like you know, get it what? Well, yeah, you get it the same day. I guess if you're well connected, and Joe knows those connections. So if you need it the next day, see Joe, he'll, he'll help you out. Um, so you're waiting for this thing to, be, to, to arrive. So that's what he said, go and wait. Don't do anything. Do not go past go, do not collect $200, do not go to jail, all that, like Monopoly, but go and wait, tarry there, until the promise that my Father has for you, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, arrives. And when he does, this is what's gonna happen. You will be endued 
with power from on high, endued. means to be clothed like a garment. It's the idea of us, uh, but it's a garment that isn't just on the surface. The idea of this is that you're endued with power. This garment is placed upon you, and it goes into you, and it becomes a permanent part of you. So it's not just something that's outward, but it's something that goes deep inwardly as well. That's what this endowment of power is. So it's not a power that just rests on the surface, but it's a power that goes deep into every area of our lives. And it needs to go deep into every area of our lives because there's hidden things in our lives that needs power to be freed from. There's lies that we believe that we need the power of God to dislodge those lies from our minds. There is wounds in our heart from past things that have happened, offenses and things, where we need the power of God to come in and, and bring healing to those areas of our wounds so that those things no longer impact and no longer affect us. How many of you got some fears that need to be driven out by power? The power of God will drive out fears. I've seen the power of God drive out the fear of death. I've seen people in a hospital knowing that death is the next thing they're going to experience in some days or weeks ahead of time. Feared, you know, just, just unbelievably tormented in fear and come to the place of experiencing the power and presence of God to where, the, where all fear is diminished and gone. So this, this idea of being endued with power is the idea of it being, being, you know, and the whole thing is, is you know, it's kind of like old English, endued with power. How many of you use that word? How many of you used the word endued this past week? I said, hey, dude. No, not hey, dude, endued. <clears throat> you know, how many of you use that? You know, we say hey, dude, we don't say endued, you know. But this endued with power is the idea that when a knight would kneel down, he would kneel down and the king would take a sword and he would rest the sword on both sides of his shoulder and he would hold the sword up and he says, I as the king of England hereby endube you, Sir Justin, to be a knight in shining armor and, uh, and give that, it just reminds me of what I said at your wedding. Uh, that, yeah, yeah, these guys are getting married, Justin, my son, and, and uh, uh, Sarah, my daughter-in-law. <laughs> Thanks, son, I had it. I almost said salam. So uh, they're down here, and, I, you know, and they're st we're standing down here getting ready to marry them. And it just it, it impacted me. I turned to Sarah to say, you know, to some, say, say something to her, and it just dawned on me at that moment. I looked at Sarah, and I said, Sarah, Kathy and I have been praying for you for whatever it was. How old, how old were you guys when you got married? 20? 25. For 25 years, we've been praying for you, never knowing your name until we met you and Justin brought you home, you know. And that just, like, moved me. And then I said, you know, that Justin is your, your knight in shining white armor. You know, your knight, knight in shining armor driving his white Ford pickup truck. You know, instead of riding a horse, he was driving. He's got a white Ford pickup truck at that time. You know, so back to the thing. So you're endued with power. The king takes the sword, puts it on both sides of your shoulder, makes his pronouncement. I hereby knight you, sir. Justin is in, the, you know, there's the kingdom of England, blah, blah, blah. And you have power and authority. You've been endued with power. And he gives you your sword and off you go, fighting for the king, right? King and the crown. How many of you want to fight for the king and the crown? The of righteousness he's going to give us, amen? That same thing. So this is what this whole term, this endued with power, means. This word, this word power is dunamis. It appears 120 times in 116 verses in the New Testament. And uh, the very first time we see it is found in the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6, verse 13. At the end of the Lord's Prayer, we have this. And uh, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the dunamis, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Whenever Jesus is translated a couple different times, not just word, just not just power. When Jesus was uh, in a crowd and the woman with the issue of blood got down on her hands and her knees, and she reached out and grabbed the hem of Jesus' garment. You know what story I'm talking about? Reached out, she was, he was on his way. Uh, I forget where he was on his way to, but he was on his way to go do another miracle, and there was a crowd, and it was this, this impromptu thing with this woman. She touched the hem of his garment, and he says, who's touched me? And the disciple says, what do you mean? There's a throng of people around you. Everybody's pushing on you and touching. He goes, no, I felt somebody touch me because I felt dunamis, virtue. The scripture says virtue flowed out of me, but it was dunamis that flowed out of me. It was the power of God that flowed from me to that woman, and it healed her, made her every bit whole. So that's what this word, word power is. Uh, Mark chapter 9, verse 1, right before Jesus took James, uh, Peter, 
and John up, or uh, Peter, James, and John up to the Mount of Transfiguration. He was standing there, it was a group of disciples, not just the 11, but a number of them that were there. And he said, <clears throat> I tell you this, he says, there are some, some here among you that will see the power of the kingdom come before you die. We'll see the power of the kingdom come. Six days later, Jesus takes those three guys up in the Mount, Mount of Transfiguration. They get a taste of that glory when Jesus appears in white raiment and you know, there's, there's this, uh, they, they get to see into their spiritual world briefly. But he's talking, there's twofold in what he was saying there. He was saying that uh, the power of the kingdom will come on the day of Pentecost when the, when the Holy Spirit fell from the, up, uh, in, when they were in, 120 were in the upper room. So he's referring to that as well as referring to the experience they had on the Mount of Transfiguration. So Jesus tells the disciples, don't do anything, don't go anywhere, go to Jerusalem and wait, tarry there until you are endued with power from on high. So they go there, there's 120 of them. There's, there's the 11, Judas has already committed suicide, hung himself. So there's the 11 original apostles and then there's uh, women, uh, and, other, and as well as other individuals, there's 120 altogether, men and women and the disciples. They go to the upper room and they hang out for 10 days. They hang out for 10 days until the baptism of the Holy Spirit comes. And we see this in Acts. Look at Acts uh, chapter 1. And read verses 4 through 8. Turn to Acts chapter 1. This is Jesus. This is the recording in Acts what Jesus said for the disciples to do. Acts chapter 1, verse 4, And being assembled together with them, Jesus commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, when she said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized you with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but... You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So, this word, I don't think I really defined this dunamis. I mean, I, I said where it comes from, and the, you know, it's the power of God. But this word dunamis is, uh, is divine enablement. It's enablement that comes from God. It's supernatural in nature. It's supernatural in purpose. It's divine enablement. It's effective and it's active. It's not dormant. It's not stored power. It's not like, you know, you have power in your phone stored there. You know, it tells you how many percent, how much percentage your battery is. But if you just never use your phone and you have your GPS turned off, you have all your apps closed, that thing just sits there. You open up the next day, it might be 1% diminished or whatever. It's just going it, to, it's not active. It's not, it's not functioning. So this is active functioning power. So you know you have it if it's active and it's functioning. If it's not active and it's functioning, then maybe you don't have it. Maybe you need an, a fresh refilling. Maybe you need a fresh impartation of power. You get what I'm trying to say here? This isn't, this isn't dormant, but it's active. It's effective. It's working power, doing what it's called to do. So, what Jesus says here, the purpose, the main purpose of the power is that you're going to be what? Look at it here. Verse 8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be what? Witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Dia, Samaria, and to the outermost parts of the world. So, the, the main purpose of the power is to cause us to be effective witnesses, saints. How many of you want to be a more effective witness for Jesus? Well, here's some things. I have eight things. I'm just going to throw these out to you. Eight things. We have power to become witnesses, and these is, these are the, this is the power that God wants to give us, and there's probably more than that, more than this. Uh, this is the power that God wants to give us in order for us to be effective in these areas so that we might be a better witness for him. Number one, we witness by becoming children of light. The very fact that you become a believer and it's evident that you're a believer is, is, a, is a witness to the sign and wonder of salvation. Being born again is a, a miracle, saints. It's a miracle. It's a sign and it's a wonder. It's a sign and a wonder. How many of you, before you became a believer, you were like, like, like wow, this, maybe, this God, maybe there is something to this God thing because so-and-so you know, 
has become a believer. He was a staunch atheist or a staunch agnostic. I mean, he was a vile individual. Now, I mean, his language is cleaned up. Things are, things are happening. There, there must be God out there, right? Right? Remember that? I mean, have you seen that? So most everybody's shaking their heads. So the very fact of becoming born again is a witness. Number two, we witness by demonstrating a transformed life. Our lives being transformed. The Bible says that we're children of light, that we're no longer children of darkness. We need to put off the former things. We need to put on Jesus. We have the mind of Christ. You know, we need to have the attitude of Christ. And there's, a, there's a transformation that occurs in our, in our lives. How many of you know someone that had a radical transformation? They were delivered from some kind of life-controlling uh, sin, maybe alcoholism, maybe drug addiction, maybe whatever the thing was. They got born again, and, they, and, and right, off the, right out of the gate, they got cleaned up and straightened out in their lives. It's powerful witness. Powerful witness, it is. You didn't do that by your own. You know, those individuals didn't do that by applying some principles about sobriety or whatever. They did that by the power of God that invaded them, their lives and transformed those lives, delivered them from the power of darkness, transformed them into the kingdom of the light of the love of God's son. We witness, number three, we witness by having strongholds broken in our lives. You know, there's strongholds that are broken. You know, how many of you, after being a Christian for some period of time, uh, you know, you had struggled in some kind of an area and you had a stronghold broken in your life. Maybe it was addiction, maybe it was some kind of stronghold to sin, maybe it was unforgiveness and bitterness. That's a, st- a major fortress stronghold that's in so many people's lives. Anybody experienced that? Yeah. So that's a witness to see that. I mean, that's a witness that, you know, it's a witness to yourself like, wow, uh, I guess I really am a Christian. You know, God really did that thing in me. You know, maybe I'm not as not the bum I think I am, you know, after all, you know, maybe there, hey, there is hope for me. You know, maybe one day I will be all that God's called me to be. You know, there's, there's hope that's in that, you know. That's, that, that's an encouragement to you, and it's an encouragement to everyone else as well. Number four, we witness by living sanctified lives. We need to live by, you know, the Bible says we are in the world, but we're not of the world, saints. One of the things that's very disappointing to me in, in modern Christianity in America right now is you really can't tell the difference much between a lot of people who say they're Christians and people who, are, who, who definitely say they're not a Christian. Sometimes you have to look at the bumper sticker to see if there's a little fish on there or a little cross maybe. They say, oh, maybe, hey, maybe they are a Christian. They get a little cross on their bumper, you know. But you wouldn't know by the way they live their lives, you know. They're, they're involved in sin to the same level that the average person's involved in sin. They, they, they compromise that. They're, they're, they're living sexually immoral lives. They're, they're engaged in all the, uh, all the things of, you know, think about stuff now. You know, we have... Think about some of the laws. It won't be long before prostitution will be legal. Marijuana is already legal. You know, alcohol is already legal. You know, I mean, how many other immoral things are going to be happening within our nation that's legal? Just because it's legal doesn't mean it's righteous, right? What the world considers moral is not what the Bible considers to be moral. Biblical morality is at a sanctified level that is far superior than, than the most moral non-believers even possibly try, trying to experience. So this is a, wit, this is a witness when our, when our lives become sanctified. The word sanctified means set apart. Set apart for a unique and special purpose. You guys have been set apart to serve God. You've been set apart to be representatives to him, to be the children of light. There needs to be, there needs to be something about you that is obviously different than than uh, the ungodly people around you in, involved in all kinds of ungodly activity. There needs to be, you know, even if it's not, even if it's not clear to them at the moment that it's Jesus, but there has to be something about, man, there's something different about that. That, 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 that There's something really genuine and attractive about that woman. And I'm not talking about her hairdo or her dress. I'm talking about her personality and, who, you know, who she is. There needs to be that happening is because we're sanctified, set apart for God. We're representing Jesus. So the way we think about people is different. You know, there, there's no room for hatred in our lives. There's no room for judgment in our lives. There's no room for, for condescension, sarcasm, all these kinds of things that degrade individuals. But we're looking, we're looking at people with, with the potential that God has placed within them. The Bible says to honor all men, honor all human beings, especially the household of faith. So it's huge in that. We witness by 
being in spiritual gifts. That's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Spiritual gifts are given to us for the purposes of witnessing. Words of wisdom, words of knowledge, revelational gifts, words of prophecy. How many of you, someone has spoke, spoken to you, prompted by the Holy Spirit, has spoken to you in some way that you know was from God and was hugely impactful in your life? How many of you have experienced that? Look at that. Almost everybody's experienced that. You know, how many of you have been on the other side of it and been the delivery of that? Yeah, not, not as many hands. Everyone can. The Bible says we can all prophesy. Scripture says that every one of us can prophesy. Every one of us can. The Bible says that every single person, when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you receive gifts of the Spirit, and you can function in, in, that, in that realm. I want to go deeper and wider in these next eight weeks as we get together. I want to go, I want to go wider, get you into some areas that you've never functioned in before, that you thought was possible. And I want to go deeper to make whatever, whatever giftings that are already deposited within you or that you, even, that you already recognize that they become more impactful, more accurate and, uh, and uh, more fluent as well. Six, we witness with God, affirming our witness to him with signs and wonders. So there's giftings, but there's also signs and wonders. You know, and one of the signs and one of the wonders is the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, when I go to the Father, we're going to send the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is, not, is going to be the believer, can, to convert the believer, but also to empower the believer. But the Holy Spirit is going to be on the earth convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. So the signs and wonders of conversion comes through the conviction of the Holy Spirit. How many of you have spoken to a non-believer and the non-believer was visibly shaken by the truth that you spoke under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? They, they, they were impacted by what you said. Anybody? Yeah, some of you. So that's that sign and wonder with, a, with Holy Spirit conviction. We witness by how we face life's difficulties. This is huge. This is huge. How we face life's difficulties is vital in, uh, in that. The last one is we witness by how we face death. The same thing. The greatest difficulty is death. There's something when you find someone who's ready to die. They're at peace to die, and there's no fear in death. It's a powerful witness to non-believers. It blows them away. Um, one of my good friends, actually, uh, Linda Lurch's uh, brother, uh, was part of, the, part of the fellowship, got saved about the same time we did. He's my age, and uh, he's facing death. He, the, the doctors have said he's, he's dying. He only has a few weeks to live, maybe a month, not sure how long, but he's, he's, uh, there's nothing they can do. I was over there yesterday, and he's totally at peace, man. He's just sitting in the bed. He said, he said I'm ready to go. He said, I'd be happy to, he said, I want to die in my sleep. He said, I'd be happy to, happy to go to sleep tonight and, and wake up in the arms of Jesus. No fear whatsoever. No, 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 not even a, a, a sense of, you know, at all. He's like, can't wait to see what it's going to be like on the other side. There's such a deep confidence and conviction within him that death does not have a final word, that death does not have victory, that he has power over death, that he has already passed from death into life, that, you know, that he is, he's, just, he's just alive and waiting, can't wait to go. Yeah. And then what's happening, too, is <clears throat> he says, he says, I feel, I feel like I have some more work to do. There's I have some friends that don't know Jesus that I want to see come into the kingdom beforehand. And, and he's been in conversation with these unsaved. He has one friend that's been one of his closest friends for 50 years, and he's not a believer. And, and they're being, they're, his friends are being impacted by, like, wow, man, I can't believe the way you're facing this thing. I can't believe that you know, you're not upset that you're going to die, that you're ready to, you're ready, to, you know, you're, you're ready and willing to go. So his way that he's facing this difficulty of, of this, whatever it is that's in, in his uh, body that's causing him, they're not even, they're not even able, they haven't even been able to define what it is. They just said, you're dying. We're not really entirely sure why, but your organs are shutting down and all this stuff is happening. And, uh, you know, can't, can't hardly swallow, can't hardly eat anything. But he has his mind, he, he can speak clearly. And uh, so the way that he's facing this difficulty, going through this major, number one, biggest trial of his life, is a witness to those that are non-believers. It's a huge witness to those that are non-believers. Worship team, you guys want to come on up? So we sang the song about revive us, you know, let your fire burn within us. So, you know, fire does two things. Fire burns away that which doesn't belong there. So if there's things in your life that you know needs to be burned out, wood, hay, and stubble that needs to be consumed and burned out of your life, then you can receive that, a touch from God and receive that power 
to eradicate that from your life. You know, if you're on cruise control, your spiritual graph of growth is on cruise control or even on the decline, and you need a fresh breath of revival, Holy Spirit power to get you back on the, on the incline of growing and maturing and becoming more like Christ, then that's available for you today. You know, whatever, whatever difficulties in life that you're facing, whatever, dif- whatever the difficulties and challenges of life that you're facing, you're not, you don't have to face them alone. You don't have to draw upon your own human resources or the human resources of other individuals to navigate and get through those difficulties because God wants to give you power to be able to overcome those things in your life. Saints, do you believe this? Do you believe what I'm saying? Do you believe what I preached here today? I mean, I'm asking you that. I don't, you know, do you believe it? It's the truth. It's God's word. I'm giving you God's word. You have not because you ask not. You know, so there's no lack in the kingdom. Jesus, Jesus said, you men who are evil, if your son asked you for, uh, for a bread, would you give him a stone? He said, no, we'd give him the best bread we could find. If they ask you for meat, would you give him a scorpion? No, we'd buy the finest kosher chicken there was to give it to them. Organically raised, fresh grain, fresh range, whatever you call that stuff, you know. Uh, no hormones, no animal, you know. So do all that. He said, then how much more, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? How much more? He wants to give it to you. It's there for you. He will withhold no good thing from those that love him, saints. Don't go out of this room without a fresh touch of power from God today. Don't leave this place without, without receiving what you need from the Holy Spirit to be able to, to do whatever it is you need to do that you know that you're not doing or, or to break the strongholds. Of, you know, addiction or it cannot, under the power of God, sin cannot, sin loses. Everything knee, bows its knee to the power of the resurrection that Jesus has provided for every one of us. You've, you've all have tasted of the power. Your lives have been transformed by the power. There's more. Turn to somebody and say, there's more. Turn to someone and say, there's no lack in God's kingdom. Turn to someone, whatever you need from him, you can get from him today. It's true. It's true. So stand to our feet. And we.